on debate, Senator Belmar. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, First of all, to begin with, gathered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Colleagues, the speech from the throne is ambitious. Growing an economy that works for everyone, fighting climate change, moving forward on the path of reconciliation, making sure our communities are safe, healthy, and inclusive. Indeed, all Canadians want to live in a country that is secure, prosperous, just, and equitable, which begs the question, can the federal government deliver those promises? This is the subject of my speech. Je soutiens que... I would argue that in the current context, the federal government cannot afford to do so. But it could be otherwise. As you know, the federal government is limited in what it can do in many areas. It is true that it manages an army, monetary policy, the criminal code, and foreign relations. But it is limited in what it can do in many areas, such as health, education, training, income security, employment, labor, industrial development, as well as climate change, security, and even street violence. To succeed in solving complex problems with social, cultural, technological, and environmental ramifications, it must better understand the situations, listen to stakeholders, and rely on their input. However, even if the government timidly acknowledges this reality in the speech from the throne, it does not provide a strategy for orchestrating coherent and convergent collective action, even though this is unavoidable. The federal government has a large amount of purchasing and spending power, and it uses it extensively, but the production of many services depends on provinces and, civ and civil society, and always on the workers and businesses that create wealth. The way to, re to achieve the throne speech agenda is neither laissez-faire nor the increased use of consulting firms. The most promising path is collaboration and cooperation between governments and socio-economic partners. As you know, collaboration between public and private uh, sectors does not come spontaneously. In order to act together, there must be agreement on the vision and on shared objectives. Dialogue is essential. In free and democratic societies, it is social dialogue that enables collective action to be orchestrated. Social dialogue is to collection, collective action what the market is to commercial transactions. It's an exchange of ideas in one side and, mother, uh, and money in the other. It, social dialogue aims at the formulation of consensus between the main actors in the world of work and their democratic participation. Consensus then allows important economic and social issues to be resolved, promotes social acceptance, peace, and helps to stimulate the economy. In short, social dialogue allows for a mutually beneficial collective strategy where losers can be compensated. Social dialogue is more than just words. It is a practice that is embedded in place and institutions. It is a mode of governance when it comes to public policy, as a contrast with parliamentary jousting. Senators, as legislators, it is important to recognize that social dialogue is good practice and a tool of governance that delivers results. Several scientific studies show that democratic countries that rely on social dialogue adapt more quickly than others. They reform and adapt their social programs to new realities. The Scandinavian countries are examples, but there are many others. Germany, for example, a federation like Canada that relies on social dialogue for employment, managed to support the incomes of its population much more effectively during the pandemic than Canada did. To be effective, social dialogue must meet certain conditions. The first, as many studies have argued, is first and foremost the political will of the government to engage in it. The second 
is the creation of a space for dialogue and the institutions to support it. Participation must be balanced, regular, and respectful, and the expected mandates must be well-defined. The United Nations, the World Bank, the OECD, and the International Labour Organization strongly advocate social dialogue, and more and more. It is the responsibility of the federal government to create the conditions for establishing social dialogue at the national level. Although, at first glance, it may seem costly in terms of time and energy, countries that practice it gain in terms of buy-in, impl implementation, efficiency, and social justice. Social dialogue has been identified by public policy experts as a key instrument for achieving a broad range of social goals. As you know, the Global Deal, a market stake a multi-stakeholder initiative for social dialogue and inclusive growth, has been created and supported by the Organization for Economic and Cooperation Development and the International Labour Office, in line with Goal 17 in the United Nations 2030 Agenda. Sorry. The advisory board <coughs> of this initiative is composed of senior advisor and economists that are well known as Olivier Blanchard, who was the, the chief economist of the Monetary Fund, International Monetary Fund, and others. A brief produced by the Global Deal provides evidence that more effective social dialogue could help to reduce inequalities, enhance the inclusiveness and performance of labor markets, and help countries to achieve their commitments under the 2030 Agenda at large. It is considered a key pillar for the success of the Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, and our government supports officially the Global Lead. Recently, on January 25, 2023, the European Commission made important recommendations to strengthen social dialogue in the member states as well as at the e European Union level. The European Union initiative launched on January 25, 2023, so very recently, aims to promote social dialogue and the role of social partners at the European Union level and among individual states by providing technical, communicational, and financial support. At the national level, national social dialogue is practiced in 72 countries, united in the International Association of Economic and Social Councils and similar institutions created in 1999. Even our neighbors to the south practice social dialogue. Indeed, at the state and territory level, the United States has established labor-related social dialogue institutions that pursue economic goals such as business growth, as well as goals of inclusion of marginalized groups. They are federally funded by the American government and were established through the Workforce Investment Act passed in 1988 and replaced by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act in 2014. There are workforce investment boards in 53 states and territories and 593 at the local level. Colleagues, it is difficult to understand why there is so little talk of social dialogue in Canada, and especially why the federal government abandoned this practice decades ago. And yet, Canada has some remarkable social dialogue initiatives at the sectoral and provincial levels. Quebec stands out for its highly structured so social dialogue at the local, uh, regional, and sectoral levels in occupational health and safety, labor, employment, and workforce development. Raises the merit of a successful Canadian sectorial initiative around the commitment to phase out coal-fired power and ensure a successful transition by 2030. Our colleague, Senator Youssouf, played an important role in promoting this commitment. In December, 
Some senators recognized the importance of social dialogue. Indeed, in 2021, a group of senators produced a report entitled Rising to the Challenge of New Global Realities. This group, shared by Senator Harder, included senators from all groups and caucuses. I was part of it along with Senator Beam Cutter, Deacon Nova, Sco Nova Scotia, Senator Dean Down Harder, évidemment, Senator Klein, Marshall, Marwa, Massicot, and Ranget. It recommended that a prosperity council could be established with the federal government acting as the catalyst. The council's mandate would be to support cooperation among federal, provincial, and territorial governments to undertake consultations with civil society to foster social dialogue and to share proposals for policy, public policy action and relevant research findings with Canadians in order to build consensus across the country. What is holding the federal government back from financially and technically promoting social dialogue at the national level. The federal government could reactivate its own funding to sectoral committees. The recent initiative of the European Commission is inspiring for Canada. In closing, colleagues, the Senate has the opportunity to make concrete progress on social dialogue in the employment sector and in employment insurance. As you know, labor and business associations have worked together to develop a cost-neutral formula for participation in the Employment Insurance Commission as an advisory committee. They are proposing to change the advisory role of the EI Commission to that of an advisor. I presented the details of this proposal to this chamber on May 17, 2022. There is no doubt that this new tool for social dialogue would accelerate the adoption and implementation of desired EI reform. EI reform is slow to materialize. The government completed its consultations on reform in the summer of 2022, and we still do not have a single report on the table. Yet, the consultations clearly demonstrate the need to simplify the system, improve eligibility, and increase benefits, not to mention improving the delivery of benefits. During the pandemic, the government was unable to deliver EI benefits other than through Revenue Canada, which did a good job. But even today, the government, or rather Service Canada in this case, is unable to deliver EI benefits in a timely manner. I don't think that would have been uh, tolerated with parity. Several organizations have put forward proposals for reform. For example, the Institute for Research on Public Policy presented a series of time-bound reform proposals on December 7th. An advisory committee to the EI would be the ideal place to debate these recommendations and present a joint opinion to the government. Perhaps it could find mutually beneficial solutions to the thorny issue of seasonal unemployment which is a stumbling block for any government, no matter which one. Colleagues, remember the episode involving EI administrative tribunals. Last year, the government proposed, in Part 4 of the Budget Implementation Act, a proposal to reform these tribunals. Workers and businesses were unanimous in their demand for it. And they were unanimous in denouncing it as well. Why? It could have, things could have been different if the proposal had been reviewed by an advisory committee associated with the EI Commission. In other words, if social dialogue had been used. Senators, it is important and urgent to initiate a reform of the system endorsed by the contributors to the system. EI has an important role to play in the fair and equitable transition to a green economy. According to many economists, a recession is on the horizon. We must act now. 
and it is our duty to recognize the demand and need for federal labor market partners to want to work together within a recognized institutional framework and to act accordingly. The speech from the throne affirms the government will work collaboratively with provinces, territories and other partners to deliver real results on what Canadian needs. The government should walk the talk by introducing social dialogue mechanism in its institution, such as an enlarged advisory council in the EI Commission. As a complementary body, we should do our job. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Merci. <clears throat>